joining us. We will get started in just a moment. All right, so as we have people joining, I'm just gonna get us started with a couple quick announcements. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it's very exciting to see so many people involved uh, in this Congress. So, um, so everyone is aware, we will be recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. If you would like to ask any of your speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen, as well as the chat, if you would like to engage with the speakers and or uh, your other attendees. And the last thing I wanna say is, uh, we kindly ask that you keep your microphones and your cameras off during these presentations and uh, to follow the lead of your presenters on when to engage with your camera or your microphone being on. So that is all I have for you all. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Nick to get us started. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for coming. This is the second part of our series on post-fire uh, management. Uh, and uh, we have four talks uh, this afternoon session, um, mostly covering Southwest and California um, ecosystems. Uh, one speaker, Chris Dunn, was unable to make it. So we have an opening at the end uh, of, the, of the session. Um, but I think I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Jen Stevens to start off this afternoon session. He's from uh, the U.S. Forest Service Washington office. Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Nick. Can you hear me all right? And can you see my screen all right? Okay. Thumbs up. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we, this is, uh, if you didn't catch the uh, the earlier session today on this topic, there's gonna to be a lot of uh, complementarity here. So it's a, a really nice session. And thanks to Nick for taking the lead and putting it together. Um, my name is Jen Stevens. I'm as of recently the uh, program lead for fire and fuels research with the Forest Service. Uh, pr previously, I was a research ecologist with the USGS based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the, and this research uh, comes out of my time with USGS. So I'm kind of wearing two hats right now. Um, but as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of complementarity in, with this talk and some of what we heard in the previous session. Um, just right off the top, most of this content is from a paper that was just published uh, as part of this special session, special issue in forest ecology and management. Uh, if you wanna grab it, you can click the QR code there and I'm sure Nick will drop the link in the chat as well. Um, but this, this work sort of developed uh, concurrently with a number of other efforts uh, on this topic of post-fire landscape management, thinking about longer term resilience and ecosystem processes in, in fire prone forests. And I'm just highlighting two here that both came out this year. Andrew presented his uh, paper earlier in the session, and then we had a nice GTR come out of California as well. Some of the co-authors are presenting later today. Um, Mark Meyer was the lead on that GTR. So these, these efforts more or less developed uh, independently and coincidentally at the same time, but maybe not coincidentally. There's a lot of uh, a lot of synergy in what uh, in, in some of the main take home messages with these reports. And I think that gives all of us some confidence that uh, we're heading in the right direction thinking about some of these questions. Um, so the impetus for, for this talk uh, with, again, with a, a large number of co-authors listed there, uh, couldn't have done this without a lot of contributions from a lot of different people. I'll focus mostly in the Southwest Four Corners region of the United States. Um, so this data here uh, just reflects the impetus for this work, which is that 12% uh, uh, of federally managed forests in the Southwest in the Four Corners region have burned within the past 10 years. That's the dot in the 2020 column there. And uh, that number was 1% in 1993. So the template for forest management is changing pretty quickly as we have uh, more and more fire across our landscapes. So we need to be thinking strategically about what to do with this. And uh, Andrew Larson touched on this in his talk, but we really have a scale mismatch with the way that we're thinking about managing post-fire landscapes and the scale of the need. So this is just one illustration of that uh, data that Kyle Rodman pulled together where we're looking at the acreage of high severity wildfire from the Four Corners region. Actually, this is from the Southern Rockies uh, eco region. So Colorado and Northern New Mexico. And you can see that we're, you know, every year now we're above 100,000 or so acres of high severity fire and our, uh, the pace of reforestation activity 
uh, has pretty much stayed flat since the 1980s. And there are a number of challenges that are facing post-fire management. Um, we, heard, we heard about some of this earlier in that reborns, reburns can reinforce initial patterns of burn severity. Um, and in instances where we have uh, large standard placing patches of fire, that may represent a transition to an alternative vegetation state uh, that's likely to be uh, in non-forest condition for an extended period of time. We also have limited resources and infrastructure for restoration. Most of our uh, efforts right now are concentrated on that immediate post-fire response, and there's a significant need to think longer term about how we can either restore resilience or maintain resilience in forests that have been impacted by wildfire. So we came up with a framework to address this question in the Southwest that, uh, again, largely mirrors what Andrew's group put out with for the Interior Pacific Northwest. Um, we basically break this out into three phases. The first is a spatial partitioning of the post-fire landscape. Um, and so we sort of, uh, as a rule of thumb, break out our post-fire landscape into uh, large and small patches. That, that's, there's somewhat of an arbitrary break point there, not entirely arbitrary, but we're thinking about large as anything greater than 100 hectares. Uh, and then we divide that into treeless patches and forest patches. And then a fifth category is young stands that are filling in after uh, high severity fire, whether planted or naturally occurring. And the second phase is to evaluate trajectories of change. So again, this mirrors a lot of that work that we heard about in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we can use that information on landscape condition that I described above and integrate it with ecosystem models, specifically integrated over given a time frame that incorporate future disturbance risk as well as social and cultural values. Uh, and determine where our vegetation condition is likely headed and whether that is desirable or undesirable. And, and we sort of stack this on top of the resist accept direct framework, which is gaining a lot of traction in ecosystem management. Uh, and there's certainly a condition where we might just accept uh, the conditions as they are unfolding, whether desirable or not, but especially if they're desirable. And if we decide that they're undesirable and we can do something about it, then we can intervene. And that that intervention is the third phase of this process where uh, we identify the relevant processes. In, in this paper, we're largely thinking about stand structure, fuels, forest regeneration. Um, and then you can prioritize actions across space and time. So we heard a lot about prioritization uh, with uh, Derek's talk, especially uh, previously in the previous session. Uh, but there are numerous spatial and temporal models that we can uh, stack on top of climate information. And when, we, when it gets to the implementation phase, uh, some guiding principles that we recommend in our paper are to diversify the portfolio of actions. So try multiple things. We heard Morris talking about uh, designing adaptive management into, uh, into management actions. Can uh, utilize new techniques, try to um, you know, try things that haven't been done before. And uh, it's gonna be really important as we think about infrastructure to sustain the infrastructure that we need to do long-term uh, post-fire management. And then with everything that we do, we, we can build in a monitoring or an adaptive management component to that. So just a few examples of this from the Southwest uh, that sort of walk through this approach with some uh, projects that uh, myself and a number of colleagues have been working on over the last five or so years. This is an example of a post-fire landscape. This is the Los Contras Fire in the Jemez Mountains of Northern New Mexico. Um, that we have partitioned into, uh, first of all, high severity or treeless areas. That's some work done by Jonathan Coop and colleagues. Uh, and then we partition that uh, into large and small patches. And again, we're using this 100 hectare uh, cutoff to distinguish large and small, which uh, happens to be roughly the upper end of what we think historical patches of high severity were, at least in frequent fire forests. Obviously, that's going to differ in different forest types. Uh, so Jonathan Coop and others put out a, a nice paper on vegetation uh, type conversion last year that I really like this heuristic from. So we can think about trajectories of change over a given time period, uh, where if we have an initial fire event and conditions don't change that much, we might be maintaining a degree of resistance of that ecosystem. But if that resistance is overcome and we have some degree of transformation of our ecosystem, that may itself return without intervention. That may, uh, you know, illustrate. Uh, short-term resilience, but we may have uh, prolonged transformation of the vegetation, at least beyond a human lifespan. And so that may be represented in this idea of a type conversion. Uh, so the, this, this curve here sort of represents three of our example post-fire landscape conditions. So I'm just gonna give, rather than go through the whole uh, suite of 
uh, landscape conditions. I'm just going to give a few examples that tie into these three different case studies. Um, the first, uh, so this is actually in reverse order. So uh, we're going to be thinking about, uh, first of all, small forest patches or refugia as an example of where resistance may be intact. Uh, we'll think about small treeless patches as those where it might have had some kind of vegetation transformation that would be expected to be resilient on its own. And then large treeless patches may be an example of a type conversion. Um, so there's been a lot of excellent work on forest refugia. I know lots of folks in the audience and some on this session are, have been involved with this. Um, but one of the things that's emerging from this body of literature pretty consistently is that uh, the smaller and more isolated the refugia, the more important it is as a seed source for natural regeneration. Uh, this is an example of a single tree refugia from the pumpkin fire in Arizona. That is almost assuredly the parent tree of the seedlings you can see in the foreground. Uh, but one of the problems with these small forest patches is that they can be at risk during uh, reburns. And the more, again, the more isolated they are, the more valuable they are. And so this is an example of a refugia that survived a fire in 1996 in the upper left. Uh, and then when it reburned in 2011 in the Los Contras fire, so this again is from northern New Mexico, uh, we had the complete loss of that particular refugia. Uh, there's another refugia on the Los Contras fire that I'm pretty familiar with. That, that's shown in this photo on the lower right here where we can see the accumulation of surface fuels uh, within and around that refugia. Uh, this, this particular incidence was one where we had a large high wind event uh, and that blew down a fraction of the remaining trees that were within this refugia and contributed to this fuel loading, although it wasn't entirely responsible for it. Um, if we think about sort of the converse of that, so instead of small patches of surviving forest, if we think about small patches uh, without forest, generally the emerging literature again is suggesting that there's going to be quite a bit of natural regeneration within patches that are less than 100 or so hectares. Uh, and we make the point that that basically means that planting is unnecessary unless you have a really good reason to plant trees. Um, in this photograph here, there's a, a tree sleeve. It's a little hard to see, but there's a tree sleeve planted right at the top of that red arrow right next to a surviving tree and a patch that's about two acres in size. And so uh, this may not be the best use of resources when there are thousands and thousands of acres that are uh, devoid of any natural regeneration. But one of the issues with these small treeless patches is that, uh, and Morris touched on this in his presentation in the previous session, that the heavy fuel loading and depending on the vegetation type, some of the naturally recurring vegetation on the margins of those small treeless patches may contribute to an increase in patch size during subsequent uh, reburns that may be due to heavy fuels or other types of fuels. Uh, and so one of the approaches of, before I get to an approach, I'm just gonna demonstrate a nice example of this from the um, Grand Canyon National Park. This is data that Chris Marks contributed to the paper. And you can see that there was a series of high severity patches in the red there in the Northern half of this, uh, this watershed that uh, expanded uh, when a fire came in about 10 years later in 2009 to include the, the yellow patches there from the Aspen fire. And so what Chris and his team did is they designed a fuels reduction project. They said, well, we're, we're seeing every time a fire comes in, we're seeing our patches get a little bit larger and we want to uh, prevent that. We want to maintain some degree of resilience in our forest that's surrounding our treeless patches. Uh, and so they did a very targeted application of prescribed fire, uh, what we call in the paper, we're calling that edge hardening. And this concept really applies both to maintaining small patches of high severity fire, as well as potentially to maintaining small uh, refugia. And we heard some uh, ideas around that from Andrew Larson's group as well. Um, but Chris did a, a November ignition, direct ignition to the logs in this uh, photo in the upper right, and they got nearly con complete consumption of the down logs without uh, I don't think they lost, I don't think they have great data on this, but they lost few, if any, trees from the overstory during this operation. Um, and so I th think there was a, a question in the chat during a previous talk, maybe from Tim, about you know, uh, ways to deal with the heavy fuels that don't necessarily involve salvage logging. And this would be one potential approach to that. Although if you uh, are letting the trees come down, then there is a potential window of time for natural wildfire to get in there and cause some uh, enlargement of these patches that we're trying to avoid, at least in this case. So uh, we again, we're, there's a lot of folks thinking about this question of what to do in larger treeless patches. This is, at least in frequent fire systems, pretty broadly acknowledged to be without outside of the range of, uh, of historical variability, at least, and, and in many cases, undesirable for future uh, vegetation and carbon storage. So, um, you know, absent absent that natural regeneration, this is a pretty uh, classic example of an alternative stable state, at least within ponderosa pine systems. Uh, the the data, at least from Colorado, suggests that. Uh, once you get beyond 120 meters or so, regeneration is quite low and it's more or less functionally absent beyond around 250 meters. There's, there's of course, variability in this as you go to different regions. But 
um, in this example from the uh, Cayman Fire in Colorado, there's large portions of the landscape that are beyond that 250 meter uh, uh, buffer distance from live trees. And so what do we do in those areas? One of the uh, approaches that's gaining some traction in the Southwest is the concept of nucleation planting. Uh, the idea here is rather than to identify a large project area and do a somewhat regular planting within the project area, uh, rather we are thinking about identifying much smaller project areas that are distributed across the landscape and planting uh, somewhat high density uh, plantations within you know, an acre, half acre to an acre or less. Um, and the idea here is that when you can get trees established, you are hedging your bets uh, spatially so that if one of these tree refugia is potentially impacted by a future wildfire, the one on the ridge over may, be may not be impacted at all. It may burn under more moderate conditions. And the more you can do that, you can get these nucleation islands to a fire resistant size that may provide the material, the raw material for natural reforestation in between to fill in the, the rest of the matrix. And that saves you on operational costs as well. There's a lot more that we need to do in the reforestation pipeline. Um, there's some, a recent paper highlights this uh, from Joe Fargioni and others, but uh, some of the work in this area involves drought conditioning of seedlings within the greenhouse to try to anticipate warmer, drier climates. Um, the planting of seedlings next to nurse objects in the field to reduce desiccation. Uh, but there's a lot more we need to do, especially on the seed collection front, if we're going to build up a reforestation capacity um, to address the scale of the need. So you can tie this all together, thinking again at a landscape scale, this is the Los Conscious fire. Um, there's a project underway, lots of partners involving uh, National Park Service, National Forest Service, tribal partners in the area, um, where we're doing uh, a reforestation strategy that involves planting uh, only 120 meters or more from live forest edges. And then stacked on top of that is a climate suitability model based on some great work from Kyle Rodman and others on uh, projected future climate suitability for ponderosa pine and Douglas fir reforestation. So here we're basically saying, you know, uh, this is that sort of climate limitation versus dispersal limitation argument that Andrew was making. And we're saying, well, in areas where we have poor suitability under a 2100 climate, the yellow areas in this, we're, we're not going to be putting trees in the ground, or maybe we'll put some juniper or something like that. But, you know, if we're doing ponderosa pine, we're really going to target the, the more uh, cool mesic end of its range. And then, you know, conversely, uh, there are, we're starting to think about this fuel strategy uh, of edge hardening as being applied towards refugia. And so the Bandelier National Monument right now is thinking about how to uh, design a fuels reduction strategy here in the light blue and dark blue portions of, the, of this uh, pink boundary here to harden the edges and pre prevent loss of these refugia under future fires. Um, so again, this is all uh, detailed in that paper, but some guiding principles that uh, really informed our approach include uh, the importance of a spatially explicit approach, a focus on prioritization. So we can't do everything everywhere and we need to be somewhat strategic about where we're choosing to invest resources. Where does uh, action, where is action likely to produce the greatest return? That's an important step of the process. Um, diversify the portfolio of actions. So try different approaches in different places. Uh, a guiding principle, I think for a lot of this work in dry conifer forests is to try to work towards fine grain heterogeneity and then again, monitor and learn. So try to build in some adaptive management ethos into the work that's going on uh, regardless, and we can learn from it as we try new things. So I think with that, uh, I will turn it over to Nick to see if there are any questions and uh, appreciate everyone's time. Thanks very much, Jen. Uh, let's see, I don't, okay. There is a question from Eric Knapp in the Whova. Uh, says, if replanting next to nurse objects that are wood, that seedling may also be more likely to be taken out in the next wildfire. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, we, so uh, when I was with USGS, we installed a study to try to get at that, where we planted a number of seedlings, either next to logs or not next to logs. And then the hope was that uh, we could get some prescribed fire or managed wildfire in there within the next decade and be able to learn from that. Um, that's a big area of uncertainty um, that I would love to see more studies try to adopt is to uh, look at the potential for, uh, you know, basically, I, I guess the approach would be if you plant next to a log, you may want to keep fire out for 10 or so years until that seedling can get large enough to where the log either wouldn't cook it or it decomposes a little bit and then puts out less heat when it does ignite. That would be the intuition, and that's the hypothesis behind the study that we set up. Um, but I think we have a lot more learning to do on that topic. Yeah. 
Great, thanks, Jens. And there's also, uh, Matthew Thompson has a question in the Q&A in the Whova. So I think you said you had that open. You might wanna take a look at that. Um, but sure, I can respond over there. Sure, great. Unless you wanna read it. I don't know what we're, I guess we're- doing. I think we'll, <laughs> we're, we'll, we'll move on to our next talk. Uh, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, sure. a, that's a complicated question anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, uh, thanks again, Jens. Okay, so our next talk, we have Amarina Winchell from Southern Sierra Associate uh, Province, Province Ecologist from the U.S. Forest Service Region 5 Ecology Program. Take it away. All right, thanks. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So as Jens mentioned, there's a lot of complementary between, complementarity between all the presentations this morning, and Jens' presentation and my presentation are very much in the alignment, so I'm really thankful to get to go after you, Jen, thanks for the great setup. So I'm gonna to talk to you about applying a science-based framework um, to an actual fire scenario. I wanna give some recognition to the team that I worked with on this first. So Angela White, Mark Meyer, Eric McGregor, Kate Fabra, and Rebecca Green. So to set this up, I'm first gonna tell you about the fire. So we worked on the 2020 Creek Fire. So this burned in California in the Southern Sierra Nevada in 2020. Obviously um, at the time, just last year, it was the largest single fire event in California history. And of course, now it's been dwarfed by the Dixie fire and it was a huge fire. So to set this up, I'll explain that when I first showed up on the Sierra National Forest in 2015, they thought they had a big fire at the time, it was 10,000 acres. So fast forward five years and they're dealing with a nearly 400,000 acre fire. And I think even more significant, a lot of this fire burned pretty hot. So 48% high severity. And so in this picture, I'm standing in one of the big high severity patches. And I promise you, I did not do that to my bangs. The wind did that to my bangs. Um, and this all used to be forested. So as you can see, there's not that many living trees left within this viewpoint, some in the drainage bottoms some off in the distance, but um, this landscape is pretty changed. And so a number of us wanted to sort of help set the planning team up um, to start thinking about how to restore this landscape. So I, other people have explained this earlier today, but I'll just say real briefly that the way this works on federal lands is that we have you know, a fire, then the NEPA team has to undergo planning. Sometimes it can take a year as Morris said, and then, um, and then after that, we can actually um, start doing the restoration work. So um, we use this post-fire restoration framework for national forests in California to sort of structure our analyses. And um, Jen showed an image of this as well. So this is a pretty general framework actually, but all the case studies are specific to California ecosystems and we, use this framework to sort of evaluate conifer regeneration, fuels and forest restoration, as well as Pacific, Pacific fisher habitat. For those of you that don't know, Pacific fisher is a mammal and the Southern Sierra population was recently listed as endangered. And their habitat has just been getting hammered recently um, with the large drought mortality event um, in the area after the 2012 to 2016 drought, as well as with the big fires that we've been experiencing. And so each of these boxes on this slide represent the general broad steps in the framework. So the first step is to assemble a team. So we had a great team. Um, most of us, save uh, Mark Meyer and I worked for the research station, the Pacific Southwest Research Station with the Forest Service. Mark and I are both ecologists on the National Forest System side of the Forest Service. And most of us were pretty impacted by the fire. A number of us, including myself, were evacuated. And I think we all know people who lost homes in this fire. Um, our first goal was to identify priority resources and desired conditions and restoration goals, which we did, but I don't have time to tell you about. Um, step number two was to gather and analyze relevant spatial data. So we're at this point in California where sometimes I wonder if we almost have too much data. We had to spend a lot of time kind of figuring out what the best data sources were to use, what best represented the landscape, how to use it, how to put it together, that kind of thing. And then the third step is to walk through this kind of post-fire flow chart to break up the landscape in terms of post-fire effects and environmental and ecological variation. 
And then steps four and five just have to do with synthesizing the results of that and building sort of a restoration portfolio. So at the first juncture in the post-fire flow chart, um, we ask sort of how to break up the landscape into two main chunks. So the, on the left, we have places where conditions were improved or maintained relative to sort of the historic or natural range of variation. And on the right were places where conditions were degraded or departed from the natural range of variation. So these were frequent fire forests, which mostly experienced low severity fire. So we decided that um, places where the fire burned at low or moderate severity or even all patches of high severity, those were, we think the fire probably did some good work. You can see the picture on the left is a picture of the Creek fire footprint where a lot of the small understory trees were killed, the overstory is largely intact and a lot of the surface kills have been reduced. So I think it looks pretty good. On the right is an example of a large high severity patch. We used a cutoff of 250 acres for that. Um, so we decided that anything that was larger than that um, might be considered degraded. And so to get at that, we just used um, fire severity data. I'm showing you that on the left, it's sort of the classic color scheme with red shown in high severity, green is unburned. So there was actually um, a decent amount of unburned within the fire footprint. And we realized when we looked at this too, though, that we were including chaparral. So we broke that out because chaparral tends to burn in sand replacing fire. And the map on the right shows uh, chaparral in blue. And then the red patches are the um, high severity patches in conifer forest um, broken up into different size classes by color. It's really hard to see the light pink smaller patches because they're small and they're light pink, but um, the maroon colors are the patch sizes that are greater than 250 acres. So those are the places we considered to be degraded. Okay, so that was the first um, juncture in the flow chart. And now I'm gonna show you the rest of it. So um, when places were improved or maintained, we ask, where do other factors threaten ecological resilience? So we thought about things like tree mortality. We had a pretty significant tree mortality event, as I mentioned earlier. In some places we lost up to 80% of the stands on the Sierra National Forest. And that really significantly changed fuel loading. And then also, you know, these fire, these forests have been fire suppressed for a long time. They've missed a lot of fire return intervals. So we thought about, you know, we have this one entry of fire, perhaps it was unburned. Um, there's an opportunity to get more prescribed fire in here. And um, so that was um, what we thought about in terms of risk factors. But then there's also areas that aren't really probably at risk. We think they might recover well. Um, perhaps fuel loading was already reduced for whatever reason prior to the fire. So though in those areas, we're recommending to start thinking about, you know, just leaving alone, kind of maintaining or promoting desired conditions in those places. So in places where there are other factors, other risk factors present, and also places that are degraded, those nuked landscapes that burn to high severity, um, then we sort of asked, where can we actually do management and be successful given current and anticipated conditions? So in places where restoration is feasible, so places we can get to, for instance, places where we have management techniques that we think can help meet objectives, then we recommend to think about taking management actions in those places. But there's a number of areas where um, restoration isn't feasible, perhaps it's wilderness, perhaps we can't get there. Perhaps it's just not gonna likely be successful based on climate conditions. Like maybe we don't wanna expend a lot of resources planting seeds in the lower end of a species range given climate change. So in those places, we recommend to reevaluate desired conditions considering climate change and other stressors. So I'm just gonna real cursorily describe a couple of these analyses to how we got to some of those places on the flow chart. So for instance, for improved or maintained areas, um, but places that might be candidates for fuel reduction or forest restoration, um, we looked at a few different things. So like I mentioned, tree mortality is something that um, we've really had to think a lot about. So we use the tree mortality data set that's depicted in the lower left. We use two F3 data sets. So those are coming from the Forest Service um, California Remote Sensing Lab. Um, and they show 
the distribution of small diameter trees, all conifers. And so we looked at those and we also looked at um, sort of burn severity. So we wanted to prioritize places that were unburned or burned at low severity for um, thinking about fuel restoration. And, and in fact, we wanted to prioritize places that were unburned above places that burned at low severity where the fire probably you know, did a little bit more work in terms of reducing fuels. And so we came up with this gradient of restoration need based on the data sets that we put together in a fuzzy logic analysis. And we did this a number of different ways, actually using different data sets in the same places seem to break out. So that was encouraging. And then we took it one step further. And this was difficult for us to make this decision on this cutoff point, um, being that we're all kind of trained in science. It can be sometimes hard to make these decisions, but um, we broke it into places where we recommended to take management actions and also places where we could recommending, we recommended just sitting back and kind of watching where we um, think we should maintain or promote desired conditions. And now I'm just gonna talk real briefly about how we were thinking about the um, high severity patches, the large patches. So on the left, I'm showing you the postscript model. So this is something that a lot of people have worked on over the years, I think. Kristen Scheib was the first lead author on this model. So this predicts um, conifer natural regeneration, yellow pine mixed conifer forest. So we looked at that in the Creek Fire footprint. Um, the purple colors are places where we expect there to be pretty decent natural regeneration. And the orange and brown are places where we expect there to be um, natural regeneration failure. And so as Jen said, I think we think this should be a place to prioritize reforestation. And then we also um, thought about fuels reduction. So, you know, these stands, if they had burned at high severity a couple hundred years ago, they'd be, it'd be a much different situation. You know, they'd be a lot smaller and there wouldn't be quite so many sticks in the ground. Like these forests are very fire suppressed and still, you know, recovering from some pretty serious railroad logging. And so um, we have these like very different kind of snag matrices than we would have had. And we can't plant within them given the fuel conditions that will result and the fact that they'll just fall on the trees that we planted. So we wanted to see kind of where those places were on the landscape. And so we did um, this analysis that you're seeing, the lower map. And we used another F3 data set, a volume data set, um, which is really the best alternative that we could come up with. Um, and looked at where it overlapped with the high severity data set to kind of get a sense for um, what that looked like. So it's broken up into low, moderate, and high um, sort of dead volume on the landscape. And this is um, how we put this all together. So I'll just walk you through the legend here on this map of the Creek Fire. So gray are places where we recommend kind of just leaving alone. The blue colored places are areas where there's lower fuels, but high reforestation need. So it might be easier to just go in and plant without doing a lot of prep work. Um, but, and we broke that into areas where there's low drought risk and high drought risk. And we use the climatic water deficit data set to get at that. And then the orange colors are higher fuel loading areas with varying degrees of reforestation need and drought risk. And then green areas are places where we re recommend thinking about fuels and forest restoration in less burned areas. And then there was this whole other um, piece of the project that I don't really have time to get into detail on, but I think it was pretty cool. It was the Pacific Fisher analysis. So we kind of ran um, the Fisher considerations through that same framework, the same flowchart process. And we thought about, you know, where their remaining intact habitat was, um, where their habitat was degraded, where their connectivity linkages are. We also came up with sort of a couple novel um, restoration strategies to think about for Fisher, including planting oaks. So when oaks um, re-sprout after a fire, they tend to be single-stemmed or multi-stemmed rather, and the Fisher prefer the single-stem variety. So we recommend thinking about planting acorns. That's very much in alignment with what a lot of the local tribes want to see too. This is my last um, content slide. So I'm just going to tell you about a couple complementary things that were happening as we were doing this analysis and sort of what where we are at now with all this. Um, so we 
conducted a couple of staff engagement workshops to, um, thank you, um, to sort of get a sense for what um, people that have worked on these landscapes for a long time think about our process and to gut check some of the analyses and data that we were using. And of course, we wholly recommend that um, all of our data, all of our analyses are sort of, you know, ground truth in some way before using them. We also have been doing a series of tribal engagement meetings um, to work with local tribes from the beginning of the project um, to get a sense for what their priorities are, how they want to be engaged, and also um, to think about places where we might want to just leave alone for, because perhaps they're sensitive or important areas for them. Um, and then I have actually gotten involved in a like much more sort of deep way than I anticipated. I became the point of contact for planning, which is um, really out of my wheelhouse really as an ecologist, but it's been really interesting. I've been doing things like, um, you know, plan, planning field visits and working with specialists to think about road decommissioning and, um, you know, discussing the right herbicide to use for invasive species and that kind of thing. But um, it's been a really helpful role, I think, to help, um, you know, slide some of the analyses that we've done into this actual planning effort. So, and you're seeing the um, proposed action here on the right. This is for the Creek Fire Ecological Restoration Project, it's purpose and need and proposed action. And so far, a lot of the work that um, our team has done that I presented to you today has made it into the proposed action. So that's pretty encouraging. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, are there any questions from uh, the audience? Don't see anything in Whova right now. There, there are two questions in the Q&A still. I'm not sure if Jens is able to uh, respond to those or not. I have a question. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'll, I'll write something there later. Thanks, sorry. Was there was there a question? Yeah, I have a question just for Marina. And, and, and I saw the map, and there were some areas that that the that they identified that still had high fuel loads and for potential treatment in the future. We've had that issue here uh, in northern Arizona, where there are areas like that, and and uh, the fuels people want to treat them because they're high fuel loads, but the wildlife people want to keep them because that's habitat for some species. Do you guys, so was that a concern or a discussion that you had with wildlife and, and other, other um, um, kind of, you know, disciplines within, within the management system? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's um, absolutely something that we're thinking about, especially now in planning when we're trying to kind of see how this is actually, or plan how this is going to be implemented. But yeah, especially with Fisher and Spotted Owl, um, we think a lot about leaving the larger legacy trees, especially, and we're also you know, thinking about leaving a lot of trees around, um, you know, places that were former, formerly habitat or currently habitat. So yeah, definitely that's something that we think about a lot. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else? All right, thanks very much. Uh, We'll move right along here. Uh, next up is Zach Steele from the University of California uh, at Berkeley. Go ahead, Zach. And you're muted, just so you know that, yeah. Okay, for some reason I couldn't find the mute button when I was sharing, let's try this again. All right, good to go. All right. Um, hey, everybody. See you. Thanks, Nick. My name is Zach Steele. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm happy to speak with you all about some work that colleagues and I have done in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of Northern California, um, focused on an area that has experienced repeated wildfire in the last couple of decades. Um, so, this talk is based on a, a recent publication by the same name, the Journal of Ecology. Um, 
And um, it was conducted with a lot of great collaborators from the Forest Service, the Florida Atlantic University, University of California, Berkeley, and the California Department of Fire um, and <clears throat> Forestry and Fire Protection. And this work was funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. Um, and it's not looking. Sorry, everybody. It seems like everything is black on the screen here. You're seeing your desktop right now. Yeah, when I was sharing, was it mostly a black screen there at the end? Yeah. That is not supposed to happen. Did not happen earlier. Let's see. You may need to share your other screen on Zoom when you go to share screen, if you have two monitors. Yeah, I had it shared. Um, I'm just restart the presentation here. Um, let's see. Let's see if it shows up better. All right. Okay. There we go. Things are showing up now, I think. All right. So, um, so a system we're working as a dry mixed conifer forest in California is similar to some of the other uh, ecosystems that we've been talking about in this session. It was historically a frequent fire system. So these burned every 10 to 20 years or so, um, but predominantly at low to moderate severity um, where most of the large fire resistant trees would survive and fire it largely kills small trees, shrubs, and consume surface fuels in the story. Um, so this would result to the, kind of these heterogeneous landscapes like you see here um, with a mix of several stages and variable forest structure. Um, but of course, you know, following your American colonization, exclusion of indigenous burning and aggressive fire suppression of the past century, uh, we've, these healthy fires have ceased, um, forests have become dense and homogenized and fuels have built up. So. Um, add on to top of this, climate change and more extreme fire weather, and we're experiencing um, more large severe fires that can dramatically alter forests. So broadly speaking, what we're trying to do um, in this study is, is understand what happens to these forests when they experience multiple of these large severe burns in a relatively short time frame. Um, so in these fire adapted forests, you can think about reburns as inflection points that either reinforce a given vegetation type or initiate transition to early seral non forested states. Um, so, much of our forests are these kind of overly dense um, uh, forests because of fire suppression and previous selective timber harvest. So, like this, uh, this image in the, the top left there, um, there's tons of fuel, very dense forest. Now, wildfires can have restorative effects on these forests if they burn at low to moderate severity leaving large fire resistant trees intact. Um, and theoretically after surviving one or more of these fires, these would become more resistant to the next disturbance. So this describes a, a negative feedback loop where frequent reburns can act to, to maintain forests. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a high severity burn can tra tradition, transition forests to early serialization, seral um, vegetation like montane chaparral. Um, and this can fall into more of a positive feedback loop where subsequent fires can are more likely to burn at high severity and, and kind of maintain persistent shrublands or other non-forested um, vegetation. Now, in these early sort of, um, areas, you can have um, some recovery. So if you are able to escape a second high severity fire, for instance, and have successful tree recruitment, we can still consider this a, a resilient um, forested state if it returns back to a forest at some, at some point. Um, so we had a chance to explore these dynamics when the 2012 CHIPS fire uh, reburned about half of the, the, the 2000 story fire. Um, these were large fires, you know, at least at the time. Um, the story was 23,000 hectares uh, and CHIPS was 31,000 hectares. Um, and, and at least until the last couple of years, uh, this was an unusual example in California. We had two large fires that intersected. Um, so these burned in the northern edge of the Sierra Nevada and southern edge of the Cascade Ranges. Um, which was historically um, Yana, Concow, and Maidu tribal territories. Um, and the reburn area there in Brown, um, where the two fires intersected, had not burned at least in the last 50 years um, prior to the 2000 fire. Um, so in addition to being relatively large burns, they were unusually severe. Um, so when I'm talking about high severity, I'm referring to areas that experienced at least 75% canopy mortality. Um, low to moderate severity areas are those with less than 75%. Um, we used severity estimates derived from Landsat imagery and the relative difference normalized burn ratio. Um, so when 
looking at kind of the first entry fires, so all of story and then the gray area um, of, of chips here, these both burned at about 31% high severity, 69% um, low to moderate severity. Um, and this is uh, pretty high when you contrast it what we think these fires used to do. So historically, we would expect maybe 5 to 8% high severity in, in these type of forests. Um, so we're quite a bit higher than that in these, these first entry burns. Um, in the second fire, in the, in the reburn area, is a bit lower, about 20% at high severity, but still elevated compared to historic references. And we can break that out by vegetation type. So those areas that had transitioned to more of an early serial non-forested state after story um, tended to burn a high severity again, about two thirds of that area reburned to high severity, potentially kind of locking these into um, persistent shrublands um, for, for the long term. Um, now it's not universal, about a third of it did escape that high severity. Um, but on the flip side, the, those that uh, survived the first fire tended to again. So about 88% of um, once burned forests uh, survived through the chips fire. So this, this supports this idea of these, these feedbacks where frequent reburns tend to reinforce vegetation types created or, or, or maintained by a previous fire. And the effect of this on kind of the overall vegetation cover was that we started out with predominantly forests within this reburn area, probably more than we would have uh, expected to see in pre-suppression era, um, to a slight majority of once burned forests after story, and to a slight minority of forested area after chips. Um, and if this, this seems like it's perhaps stabilizing a little bit, but it's continuing to erode um, forests in this area. Um, and perhaps there's a little bit of recovery in these early serial areas to, to forests. Um, and we're able to get that at this a little bit. Um, it's difficult to do in the short term and with, especially with remotely sensed data, which is primarily what we used here. But fortunately, um, Michelle Coppoletta and other, other folks of the Forest Service had the foresight to put in some, some field plots after story, which then reburned in chips and were again sampled afterwards. So we can start to get this at this a little bit. Um, and this table here uh, is looking at, um, is looking at uh, uh, kind of the number of stems per hectare in these forestry plots and first showing the, the areas that burned to high severity in the first fire and then low to moderate in the second. So there is um, evidence of, of recovery in these areas, um, both for conifers and hardwoods. And hardwoods, um, in this case, are primarily oaks, which can re-sprout after being top killed. Um, the conifers need to uh, um, regenerate from seed. So within the uh, the understory and the subcanopy layers, uh, we are seeing a decent amount, at least in some of these plots of, of regeneration. Um, this is these are far below what you know we might think of good stocking if you're going to be replanting these, but we are seeing some regeneration. And then and above eight meters, there that those canopy trees um, likely survived both um, fires. Again, we're not necessarily talking about complete loss of trees, just um, over 75% mortality. Um, but looking at those plots that experienced two high severity fires, um, we had uh, no trees, no surviving trees, and no um, uh, saplings of, of, of conifers. We did see some hardwood um, regrowth, um, quite vigorous in, in some of these plots, but this was a minority of plots, only about 9% um, saw uh, hardwoods coming back in these areas, and, and the rest is likely to persist as shrubland, at least for the foreseeable future. So that's... Uh, kind of the descriptive side of things, the question of what happened in this reburned. Um, but we also wanted to get at the question of why are we seeing these dynamics? Specifically, we focused on why some areas were resistant to high severity reburn and able to maintain forest state if they were still forests after the first fire, or um, if they were uh, early serial vegetation, does this, are they able to continue recovering despite the second burn? Um, so remember that we observed these feedbacks where the majority of, of the landscape is either taking this low, low, or high, high path, um, but we did see exceptions, and we want to know, you know, under, under what con um, conditions are we seeing these exceptions or staying in these feedback loops. So again, thanks to our partners, the Forest Service, we have some valuable data, in this case, uh, in the form of LIDAR that was taken between the two fires in 2009. Um, and then uh, a second LIDAR flight was, was flown in 2015, um, giving us data there as well. Um, 
And this helped us characterize fine scale forest structure at different vertical strata across the reburn area. Um, we did this within the reburn area, that's primarily what I'm focusing on, but also um, in unburned reference areas with the 2015 data, uh, which I won't be getting in, into um, today unless there's questions about it. But in short, we calculated vegetation cover um, between one to two meters, which we refer to as the understory, between two and eight meters, the subcanopy, and above eight meters, which is the canopy. Um, with LIDAR, it's difficult to get under um, under one meter um, just because the, uh, you know, getting the, the, the returns from the ground versus um, really low uh, surface fuels is difficult to differentiate. So we generated um, continuous surfaces of vegetation cover for each of these three strata across the reburn area and then using a grid of sample points calculated mean cover and then the variation or heterogeneity of cover around each point. Um, topographic and fire weather variables were also summarized around each sample point and whether a point burned at high severity during the reburn was reported. So we use these data to fit two models to test the likelihood of a point burning at high severity in the reburn. Um, one model was fit using uh, forested points and the second using early serial non-forested points, say those that experienced one high severity event during the story fire. And then predictors were those, those structural variables, the mean and heterogeneity of cover uh, at the different st vertical strata, topo topo topographic variables and fire weather variables. Um, the response variable is binary, that is whether a point burned at high severity, and if instead a point burned at low to moderate severity, that was considered um, resistant to a high severity reburn. Um, so showing some marginal effects plots here. So the, uh, on the vertical axis, there is the probability of burning high severity. Um, if you're, you know, uh, conversely on the low end of that, you're more likely to be too resistant to the high severity. Um, looking at our two topographic um, metrics that we looked at, uh, topographic wetness index, you can kind of think of the, the bottom of, of these draws where the water is, is, is falling into. Um, and unsurprisingly, the wetter an area, uh, wetter the topography, the less likely you are to burn at high severity. And this was true both for the early serial model, um, which is the, the yellow line there, and the, the once burned forest model, which is the blue line. Um, and topographic um, roughness, or the kind of the variability of topography, was also uh, showed a negative relationship with high severity fire. And this was especially strong for the early serial vegetation. So. Um, those areas that were able to escape high severity fire the second time and resist it um, tended to be in, in more um, rough topographically uh, rough areas. So looking at, at vegetation cover, um, the understory layer, we saw this positive relationship with uh, the density or the amount of cover um, at one to two meters and the likelihood of burning at high severity. And this aligns with kind of the conventional wisdom that uh, surface fuels and, and small um, ladder fuels are carry fire and, and contribute to in, intense fire and, and severe effects. Um, what's maybe a little bit less intuitive are our results in the sub canopy um, and then the canopy cover. In this, we saw a negative relationship. So in this case, the more dense the, the sub canopy and canopy was in the case of forest, um, the more likely it was to resist the fire. So we think we saw this result for a couple of reasons. Um, first, remember that the canopy and sub canopy is made up of vegetation that survived one fire already. So that first fire likely selected for species and individuals that are already resistant to fire. So think your large diameter pines while removing fire sensitive vegetation, your small diameter firs, for instance. Um, and second, there aren't really many high density forests left after the first burn. Um, so we're really contrasting kind of sparse canopy and sub canopy with moderate amount of cover. Um, if we had pre-fire data in the fire suppressed area, which unfortunately we didn't with the uh, 2009 lighter, um, we might have seen more of a kind of a U-shaped response, where you know the the areas that are most likely to burn at high severity are these over, overly dense um, fire suppressed areas, and those characterized with sparse um, canopy and sub canopy, um, which maybe uh, allowed more of this understory cover to grow in. Um, Finally, we looked at the heterogeneity of canopy. Um, and for both, uh, well, in the subcanopy for both vegetation types and then for forests in the canopy, the more heterogeneous that that cover was arranged uh, horizontally, the more likely it was to resist a high severity fire. So putting all this together, the, the most resistant stands appear to be those with moderate canopy cover and subcanopy cover, but variable cover. 
um, that perhaps shades out understory growth, which contributes to high severity fire. And especially if those stands are located in relatively wet and variable topography. So we also looked at um, just briefly our weather, um, specifically uh, relative humidity and wind, wind speed. And this actually didn't turn out to be that important for the early seral model, but for the forest, it went more or less as we would expect. Days where there is higher relative humidity tended to burn less severely, and those with high wind speed tended to burn more severely. All right, so some kind of the, the, the take homes. And if we want to think about maintaining forest resilience in these reburn landscapes, how to do that. And we can kind of approach it from, from both sides of this resilience idea, I guess. First, you can think about um, encouraging recovery following these events. Um, and natural recovery look uh, relatively poor, um, especially if you had two high severity events, um, you know, 12 years apart. Um, and early serial vegetation is uh, tended to burn a high severity again. So thinking forward and thinking about the next disturbance, um, it, it, you might want to think carefully about where to plant. And, and some of our sp other speakers were, were talking a lot about this in their um, post-fire frameworks as well. So thinking about where to, to expend maybe your limited resources. And in this case, um, thinking about uh, areas that are topographically wet and variable um, and less likely to burn a high severity in the next burn um, might be useful. And then second, it, we had a decent amount of oak uh, regeneration in some of these places. So we might want to consider allowing or facilitating um, transitions from conifer to oak forests uh, where that natural uh, uh, resprouting is occurring. Um, oaks tend to be pretty resilient to fire in this system um, and also to drought, which we're seeing more and more often. And the other side of that is, is thinking about resistance. So the forests that um, reburned uh, in these areas were were likely or had experienced one burn already were more likely to survive in the reburn. And so I think a lot of our effort uh, needs to be focused on maintaining or, or building upon kind of the parcel restoration um, that these fires have, have provided. Maybe getting back in there with prescribed fire or other treatments um, within a decade or, or two to help kind of uh, build on that resilience. And then I wanna highlight this idea of, of heterogeneity um, and we can use that in, to build into our fuel treatments so rather than just reducing fuel loads, but actually thinking about how um, we're uh, kind of arranging the, the fuel or the vegetation on the landscape is important. And then also when we're planting, thinking, keeping heterogeneity in mind so that when the next fire does come through, um, hopefully after those have grown up a bit, um, it's more likely to, to survive. Now, I, I you know, really in, have been thinking more about this resistance piece rather than the recovery side, um, in part because uh, the, the uncertainty in these, uh, you know, recovering areas is, is pretty high and the chance of reburning is, is increasing. And any, any of you that know this area um, know that we had the Dixie fire this year. And this actually, you know, came out about a month after this publication came out. And the Dixie burned completely through this, both the Story fire and the Chips fire. Um, and two minutes left, thank you. Um, so it really you know, highlights this, this idea that we need to think about the next disturbance when, when managing these landscapes. Um, and I've also put up you know, a preliminary, preliminary um, fire severity map there. Um, this you know, likely change a little bit as we get better data, um, satellite data, but this highlights how much high severity there was in those black patches. And these are pretty massive patches as well. So, all right. Um, I think I only have like a minute left, but if there's a question, maybe we have time for one. Thanks a lot, Zach. That is a lot of high severity fire, the Dixie fire. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, any questions for Zach? Yeah, so that, that Dixie is going to be pretty interesting looking at the reburn. I, th I think uh, Michelle Copaletto had looked at the number of other fires it interacted with, and there's there's a lot of a lot of opportunity to look at a twice burned and three times burned in that landscape. So we'll we'll see what that looks like soon. So I, I have a quick question. Please. So my, my question was like I, I really like your recommendation on on that in terms of kind of the maintenance, right? We have these areas that look pretty decent that have burned. 
So why not go in there for spray fire? The question that you know, working with the, when we're working with managers is that you you're gonna to treat that area, you're inevitably gonna have to treat the high severity area too, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to go around these areas, and then and then you're and so so. Have you talked to managers about doing that, or are there ways that people are doing that? You know, uh, different experiments, different ways to kind of burn the the you know the good the the stuff that needs it and avoid the, the high severity. Yeah, they're getting back into what, you know, maybe coming kind of chaparral or, you know, herbaceous areas or whatnot that you're asking. Um, well, for example, like we, what we've seen is that there are actually some of the high severity areas are actually have regeneration. And right. because they're introducing fire to those moderate, uh, initial moderate severity areas, they're having to burn uh, that regeneration. And so they end up killing the regeneration that's coming up. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of work trying to get fire back in kind of early, um, earlier than we normally would have, so maybe 15 years after planting or something like that. And with, and it seems like they're having some success. I mean, obviously you'd have to be careful to to burn when it's you know it's relatively high humidity and you're not getting quite as much consumption as you might want under you know a mature stand or something like that. So I think people are thinking about that. I don't think it's been done much. Um, others maybe can correct me, but, um, I, but I, I, think, think, go ahead. I think what you're talking about is, I think is, is the ideal way is, is to experiment with different burn windows yeah. is the key, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's definitely will need to be part of the picture. Um, and I think Jens was talking about doing some of this, uh, I think the term he used was um, edge hardening. Um, so yeah. maybe protecting some of these refugia or, or, you know, partially restored areas from a fire coming from a chaparral stand or something like that. So really targeting your management is probably going to be necessary, especially because we can't, we can't treat a million acres, which is nearly what Dixie was. Um, we are far below that so far. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for all the great questions. Uh, just to note, Jens has responded to a few of the questions in the chat. Um, he put a lot of effort into that. So you guys can check those out. Um, and then so on to our final talk of the, <laughs> <thanks for, laughs> on to the final talk of our session. Uh, we have uh, Tucker Furness from the uh, Pacific Northwest Research Station um, in Wenatchee. And uh, I've seen a preview of the talk and it's a it's a multimedia explosion. So enjoy. <laughs> okay, are you seeing my screen? Excellent. Um, oh, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Tucker Furness. I'm a postdoc with Nick Poback and Paul Hesberg at the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Um, my talk today is going to be uh, a little bit, we're going into model land. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about some uh, sort of work that's still very much in development um, using a, a process-based landscape simulation model to model fire and forest dynamics over the coming century. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about sort of the model development and calibration and uh, using it to address some post-fire management questions. So the uh, model that I'm using is Landis. Um, which is an open source landscape dynamics model with a number of extensions available to simulate various landscape processes like fire, harvest, and wind disturbance. Landis is spatially interactive, meaning that it can, uh, meaning that the dynamics of one cell are influenced by neighboring cells, um, both adjacent, immediately adjacent cells, and distant cells across the landscape. Um, and this enables Landis to simulate inherently spatial processes like seed dispersal and wildfire. Um, this is a key point, as it isn't possible to capture these inherently spatial processes with phenomenological models, um, such as those contained within FDS um, or, or software like that, um, that model pattern rather than modeling the process itself. So I'm using this model specifically to simulate the effects of forest dynamics, growth, mortality, and dispersal, uh, wildfire, and various land, man land management scenarios, including thinning and prescribed fire and salvage logging on a large landscape in North Central Washington. Uh, my proximate objective with this work is to determine if silvicultural management, including different post-fire management options, can alter wildfire dynamics on the landscape 
And if so, to what extent and spatial distribution, uh, those treatments can be applied to optimize treatment effectiveness. I'm also interested in using the model to investigate more basic questions about landscape dynamics, feedback mechanisms, type conversion, and alternative stable states. So as I mentioned, the work this work is very much in development. Um, so right off the bat, I wanted to let you know that I'm definitely interested in feedback. Um, the, uh, there's, there's a lot of potential benefit of using process-based models like this, but uh, it's, it's by no means a replacement for more field-based um, empirical work. And uh, I'm hoping that to, to sort of pursue this work in a way that complements empirical work uh, as best as possible. Um, but, but that's something that I've been thinking a lot about is, is the, the, what role simulation models have in, in sort of enhancing our understanding and projecting it forward. Um, so simulation models have the potential to be really useful, but, but this usefulness is, is completely contingent on their credibility and really rigorous validations of Landis, of previously developed Landis models are perhaps a little bit more scarce than we might hope them to be. Um, and validation in one landscape does not mean that the model is necessarily validated for use in another landscape. Um, so in the talk today, I want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about how Landis works and how I've calibrated it and validated it in the landscape that I'm going to be applying it to. And I'll share some results from, from this model, some preliminary results exploring how different post-fire management strategies affect future fires and patterns of forest on the landscape. So in Landis, uh, the landscape is represented as a raster grid, where each cell represents a cohort of trees. And there can be multiple species, multiple ages within one cell. Growth and mortality are applied within cells, depending on the, the characteristics of the species that are present in that cell. And dispersal is applied between cells. Uh, climate is applied to the landscape. and uh, it can vary across the landscape in, but, and you can, you can cut up the landscape in different ways and apply different climate, um, different climate forecasts and, and different climate histories to, to the landscape. Fire is simulated. There's a cell-to-cell a, a -cell process-based fire extension that simulates fire uh, by determining probability of spread to adjacent cells. So the fire regime of a landscape is an emergent property of essentially fire spread. And fire spread is determined by topography and weather and fuels. And then land management works as you might expect. You can apply different uh, silvicultural strategies and prescribe fire to different parts of the landscape um, and, and to different stands um, based, on, based on a stand file that, that you feed in. So I'm applying this to uh, Menachee and Etiat watersheds in north central Washington. Uh, this is a, a landscape characterized by really steep elevational gradients and really diverse forest types, everything from grasslands and shrublands in the low elevations to a lot of ponderosa, and mixed both moist and dry mixed conifer forests to uh, subalpine forests and, and alpine meadows in the higher elevations. Um, it's also an interesting landscape in that about half of it is wilderness, which really constrains the management options. Um, but it's a very characteristic landscape in that way um, of at least a lot of the interior Pacific Northwest where most of the biomass and most of the fire lives in the wilderness. So it's, uh, although our, our management options are, are limited in the wilderness, that's really where we need to be thinking about management um, because that's where that's where the ecosystem services really reside. The, I use soil layers from the NRCS Sergo database to come up with maps of initial carbon soil depth, soil field capacity. And as you might imagine, there are many, many parameters. Um, to come up with an initial estimates of all these parameters, I've looked to previous Landis studies from, uh, from similar areas and uh, when those are not sufficient, I found literature values and expert opinion, essentially um, more or less a, a reasonable guess on numbers to come up with, uh, with the initial parameters for, 
for all of these all of these different species parameters. And I just want to note that these are all uh, this is essentially how lambda is always set up initially, but these are just initial parameters and the process of calibration is the process of tweaking these two until a model behavior is in line with something that you are calibrating it to. So these parameters are all iterative tweaked um, over hundreds of runs to, uh, to essentially match biomass dynamics to, I, I used FIA plots um, that I projected forward with FVS to, uh, to come up with an estimate of, of how, how much by the absolute amount of biomass and the trajectory of biomass over time. And I wasn't looking to match the biomass perfectly, but, uh, but just for a, a reasonably good level of correspondence. Um, Uh, so I used the, there's a fire extension called Scrapple, uh, which is a, a recent fire extension developed for Landis that has, the, the crux of it is that it has different fire types, natural, accidental, uh, or rather different fire ignition types, natural, accidental, and prescribed fire. Um, and the probability of each of those types can vary, and uh, our suppression effort that we apply in the model can also vary depending on type. So I used the ignition frequency from the past few decades of observed fires from the fire occurrence database to, to inform ignition probability maps for each of the different fire types. And I built maps of suppression effort depending on land use and proximity to proximity to uh, the WUI and developed areas. And then I calibrated the fire spread probability. Again, this is driven by fuels and weather and topography. And I calibrated that so that simulated fire size and frequency and patterns of spread um, were comparable to, to MTBS, MTBS fire history. Um, I did this both visually with the maps as well as with the fire size distribution um, so that the, the annual annualized fire size distribution is approximates what we've observed in the past 30 years. So, uh, what is this model good for? Uh, I would say that the reason that I'm interested in it is that it's a window into the future. It shows us how this landscape might evolve over the next hundred years, uh, or at least over the next few decades. And because it's process-based, it offers us the potential for surprise. We're not simply projecting historical trends forward. We're modeling process so we can capture uh, if dynamics change, if, if there's a, a type shift or, or if processes of the future are, um, have a different effect on the landscape as compared to processes that have been driving landscape dynamics over the past few decades, we can potentially see some of those dynamics play out with a process-based model. Um, comparing different management alternatives gives us some uh, sort of strong applicability of this model to to land management, we can we can evaluate different land management strategies and see how those will play out. And also, we can uh, ask some more basic questions, and deepen our understanding of how the landscape functions. So, uh, I did just a, a quick little ex exploratory analysis of uh, how post fire management uh, might affect patterns of carbon on the landscape and. Uh, and patterns of future fire. So this was a just a simple scenario comparison where I had a wildfire scenario and then a wildfire scenario in which I, salvage logging was applied in burned areas. And I asked the question, how does post fire salvage logging affect the size and spread of future fires, as well as uh, patterns of amount of carbon on the landscape in different forms. Um, soil organic matter was generally increased by wildfire. Um, and dead wood was as well. Surface litter was generally decreased. Um, soil organic litter, dead wood, increasing by the mortality of trees. Surface litter, decreasing by simple consumption due to fire. Um, the key points here were that wildfire increased dead wood production, uh, which is fairly obvious, um, and this contributed to greater soil organic matter. Salvage logging reduced this, as we would expect, because we're removing 
removing the dead wood before it has a chance to be a, a surface uh, surface load of wood or be incorporated into SLM, but reburn them typically as well. So the difference between the wildfire only scenario and the salvage logging scenario were not uh, as pronounced as we might expect um, because reburning was essentially doing the work that salvage logging was. Um, and fire and salvage logging, uh, they both reduce surface litter, but this was an artifact of the model because surface litter was it's calculated by the fire extension. So in cells that did not burn, surface litter is not calculated. Um, so that this was, uh, I put this up here as sort of an example of, of how we need to be really careful using, using really complex multi-model uh, sort of nested models like this because there, there are uh, artifacts abound and, and we need to really think really critically about some of the model outputs before uh, putting all of our confidence in what they're telling us. This was, to my surprise, there was not uh, much of a difference in overall area burned. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons, um, and, and I'm not sure yet uh, whether this has to do with, if this is essentially a, a due to how fire spread probability is generated within Landis, um, or if this is telling us something, uh, if this is telling us something about uh, that salvage log, so I'd be, salvage logging doesn't have much of an effect. Um, that would surprise me because we know from previous research, research that salvage logging normally does influence patterns of future fire and future fire severity. Um, so this is sort of an example of um, a way in which if our, if our simulation model does not agree with empirical research, um, it tells me that we need to interrogate the simulation model and, and why it's telling us that answer. A few takeaways are that wildfire was the dominant force in this landscape. The effect of salvage logging on forest carbon was difficult to differentiate from those of fire. Um, a few implications for post-fire management are that wildfire really runs the show. Fire lives in the wilderness, but so does snow and so does biomass. Uh, so wildfire and managed wildfire prescribed fire are really going to be keys to uh, managing the parts of the landscape where really key ecosystem functions are being provided. Um, and maybe the single most important takeaway um, is something that I think ties into uh, to some of the work that we've been talking about today um, and certainly some of Zach's work that he just shared, which is over the next 100 years, most of the land, this landscape is going to burn and most of it is going to burn more than once. So good post-fire management should really just be good land management. We should think of post-fire management as um, we should be thinking about the next fire um, because it will be coming and it will probably be coming soon. So we should think about uh, not simply restoring, a, restoring an area in terms of um, a forest that might escape fire, but preparing it for the next fire that will happen. Uh, yeah, many people to thank um, my lab and uh, some, some Landis folks for their help with many, many questions that I've asked them. Um, and I would love to take some questions if we have any time for that. Yes, we do have some time. Any questions for Tucker? Nick, it's Andrew. I put one in the chat, but if you can hear me, I'll just say it. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm wondering about, you know, thinking about the, the phenomenon of, of feedbacks, which Zach just gave us great examples of, does, does Landis represent those either as sort of like a feature of the model or generate them as sort of an emergent outcome? Uh, or is that not really showing up? Yeah. Um, Thank you. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> hopefully, yes. But hopefully, not specifically as a as a feature of the model, but as an emergent property of it. Um, that being said, um, the I think that that's a real to me that's a real sniff test of of. We know that there are feedback mechanisms with fire and reburning, and um, so 
if the model is not representing them, there's there's something fundamentally missing. Um, and and I think the, the yes, we so we should start to see feedbacks. Um, it's a little too early right now to know if if we are. Um, and I think if we're not, there's the, the reasons that we might not are um, essentially that the um, it's a very comp Landis is very complex, but um, in that it's modeling a whole lot of different processes, the patterns of, of fire spread um, are are influenced not only by fuels, but by fuel moisture and um, fuel decay and and things that uh, are, I'm not sure yet, are, are well represented in Landis. Fuel amount is is in there, but uh, but diurnal diurnal effects on fuel moisture not well represented. Um, so so it'll be really interesting to see if if um, if those feedbacks are able to be captured by sort of the the, the kind of coarse grain approach of Landis, or if they're more dependent on on some more nuanced aspects of of fuel development and um, that might not yet be incorporated into the, the fire extension of Landis, basically. Uh, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, so we're, we're out of time with our, our, our speakers today, uh, you know, in this session, but we, we did have one, um, our final talk, uh, he, uh, they uh, had to cancel the last minute. So we do have some time for general questions for um, all the uh, uh, speakers in both uh, the morning and afternoon session. So um, I, I might just, uh, I, I see that Eric Knapp has a, a question in the, in the chat. Um, I think this is for you, Tucker. He says, with fire, um, ember driven, like for example, ember driven spread, it may not just be adjacent cells that drive fire behavior, but landscape fuel loading. Could this be one reason that the difference between salvage and uh, not on fire spread did not show up. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I think yes, that that certainly could explain it. Um, that you also bring up really uh, what I see as as a um, an Achilles heel of the current stage of of the Landis fire extension, which is it doesn't have it, it is still cell to cell. It doesn't have larger scale fire behavior, um, which is important and is becoming increasingly important. Um, it doesn't have embers, embers jumping different parts of the landscape and it doesn't have um, sort of fire driven weather. So um, that's a, that's a, yeah, I, I think those, those processes, the, the neat thing about Landis and the fire extension is that it's constantly under development and that's um, those other attributes of fire behavior at, at multiple scales hopefully will be incorporated into future model developments, but right now it's not there. Um, and I think that is a limitation of the current state of it. Great, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'd just open it up to the, to the crowd. Uh, are there any questions that people have for any of our speakers today? First session, everyone's got the uh, cold feet so far. All right, well, um, if, if nothing else, you know, we, uh, everyone's uh, emails have been sort of provided um, and we can, uh, you can get back to the individual speakers uh, after the fact. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of close out today. Thank you everyone for joining um, both the morning and afternoon session. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I guess I'll throw it back to Anthony to close us out. Thank you so much. Um, I want to first say thank you to all of our speakers. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and uh, being engaging today. This session will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. 
Up next, uh, we have about, you have a little over a 30 minute break uh, before our last set of breakouts begin. We have two special session breakouts, a general session and a safe meeting and trivia network session, all beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern time. To choose the one you'd like to join, use the agenda tab to the left of your screen and click sessions. You can also click subsessions for more details about what to expect. To join the session offering Spanish and Portuguese interpretation, be sure to select the session titled Actions for Sustaining Biodiversity in Fire-Prone Ecosystems. Thank you again, everyone, for joining, and thank you for our speakers, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Bye.